Good morning. Uh, the day after Christmas, and we're still here. God has blessed us. It was very cold this morning. Uh, been warm lately. We had a warm Christmas. Uh, well, it was warm up to Christmas. I think it only got up into the low 40s yesterday, but it was warmer than most Christmases around here. Uh, we're in, we'll step into the freezer for a couple of days. <laughs> and then I think toward the end of the week, maybe have some warmer weather again. We have a chance of just snow and ice tomorrow, but uh, it looks like the pre precip may not come at the appropriate time for it to be. That's, we just have to wait and see. You know, we haven't had anything yet so we just don't know what's going to happen the weather is different than it used to be now we're in the book of the prophet of jeremiah chapter 15 we might finish today i'm always telling you that and then i'm always wrong <laughs> but uh remember this is the second half of the message on the drought god is explaining the judgment to jeremiah Jeremiah has asked God to protect him. He's complaining to God because the people hate him and they're trying to kill him. They've already taken away everything he's got. They still haven't taken away his life yet. Jeremiah got a little knee shaking going on here. A little weak in the knees. I would be too. Jeremiah complains to the Lord, beginning in verse 15. O Lord, thou knowest, remember me and visit me and revenge me of my persecutors. Take me not away in thy long suffering. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. Thy words were found and I did eat them. And that word was unto me. The joy. And rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name. O Lord God of hosts. I sat not. In the assembly of the mockers. Nor rejoiced. I sat alone because of thy hand. For thou hast filled me with indignation. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable? which refuseth to be healed. Wilt thou be altogether unto me as a liar and as waters that fail? Now, a lot of people say that God is going to tell Jeremiah to tell the people something, but no, God is talking to Jeremiah. The confusion comes is when God begins in verse 19 saying, if thou return, in other words, anyway, if you return to me, well, we know that, I'm sorry, my, my ear itches, that means something. Does that mean somebody's coming to see you if your ear itches? Well, John and Heather will be back over here in a little bit, so they're coming to see me. Um, but God is telling Jeremiah to return and continue to return. It is, uh, well, let me just read it, and it's a little easier to explain the, the, the construction of it, because God is definitely talking to Jeremiah. He's not telling Jeremiah to tell the people this. Jeremiah has already told the people repeatedly that God has said, if you return to God, He'll bless you. He'll, he'll take care of you. He'll preserve your life. 
he'll let you stay here in the land. Uh, if you return to him fully, he he will he will bless you. He will save you from the sword. When Nebuchadnezzar's army comes and the, carry the people away back to Babylon captive, you don't have to go as a slave. You can stay here. I, I'll, I'll I'll make it okay for you to live here. If you just return to me. A lot of people think that this is what God is telling Jeremiah now, but that's not true because Jeremiah, in the first place, never let God left God. He's complained some, he's cried some, he's never left God, never doubted God. He's confused because the bad things are happening to him. He's confused because the men of Anathoth have taken away his inheritance, his father's right to the land they've taken away the land itself they've taken away his house his property and they've taken away his sweetheart so he can't marry her and they've given her to another man Jeremiah never left God during all that he complained a little and he lamented a little but we would all do that So God is not telling Jeremiah to return to him. God has Jeremiah. God is not telling Jeremiah to straighten up and fly right. Jeremiah is straight and he is flying right. So then what does this mean? Verse 19, let's just read it and then we'll pick it apart like we always do. Verse 19, therefore, thus saith the Lord, if thou return, then will I bring thee again, and thou shalt stand before me. This is a particular phrase that is used of the prophet and the priest and the king, not usually used of the people. So, I don't believe God is telling Jeremiah to go tell the people this because he's already begging them in another way to return to the Lord. If thou return, then will I bring thee again, and thou shalt stand before me. And if thou take forth the precious from the vile, good morning, Rick, and uh, thou shalt be as my mouth. Well, God did this to Jeremiah. He made his words mouth pure. He made his heart pure. He captured him. He touched him and, and, and made him a prophet of the nations when he was only 17. And he says, everybody's going to hate you, but you're going to say my words. You are going to be my mouth on earth, Jeremiah. So that can't be what he's talking about. And he says, let them return unto thee, but return not thou unto them. Now look at it this way. Remember... When Satan tempted Jesus during the, the the trial during the during the temptations during that time in the wilderness after his baptism when he was in the wilderness for forty days and forty nights and was tempted of the devil and he was afflicted by the wild beasts. The temptations is. Satan says, if thou be the son of God, then make these stones bread. If thou be the son of God, Satan knew that Jesus was the son of God. Jesus knew that Jesus was the son of God. So what does this mean? And then he says, he says, if thou be the son of God, then cast thyself down from this mountain or the pinnacle of the temple, wherever they were, and God will send his angels to save you. Jesus knew he was the Son of God. Satan knew he was the Son of God. If thou be the Son of God. We have the same, and it is a, it is a uh, Jacobin language construction. The King James era English actually pre-King pre James, dating back to Elizabethan, this is almost Elizabethan English here, the usage. God is saying, if thou return, then will I bring thee again. God is saying, since you return, 
since you have returned to me, since I've returned you to me. And if thou take forth the precious sense, you take care of the precious. Because you return, then I'll take you unto me. Because you return, you stand before me. Because you return, because you take the set, take forth the precious from the bile, then you're my mouth. God already made him his mouth. God is explaining to Jeremiah his position and why it's the way, why it's the way it is. God is telling Jeremiah, he says, look, you obeyed my commands. Uh, because you returned to the sound of my voice and did everything I told you to, I've brought you again to me. Because you, you, you took the vial and separated it. I mean, you're standing before me. Your mouth is speaking my words because of all this. Then he does switch and he tells Jer Jeremiah because he switches from thou to them. He doesn't say if if thou or let them return unto you, not, not, not you, you return unto me. The end of chapter nine, verse 19 says, because of all these things you're doing, because you're standing before me, because my words are in your mouth, because you separate yourself, because you sit alone. He just said he sat alone uh, three verses ago, and he didn't mix, and he didn't mingle, and he didn't participate in their ungodly life. He had a, lived a separated life. You don't hear much about that anymore, but you have to live a life separate from the world if you're going to serve God. You just, you can't, you know, you're in the world, you're living in the world, and all this stuff is going on around you, but you cannot let it affect you, and you cannot let it distract you, and you must not participate. You can't act in approval of any of the godless activity of this lost and dying world, especially now that the end of the world has come upon us. You can't be part of the chaos. So, what God is saying to Jeremiah in verse 19, look, I brought you again and you're standing before me and you're separating yourselves and you're my mouth. Now he's going to talk about the people who are afflicting Jeremiah, these men who want to kill him, these men who have robbed him of his home, his land and inheritance and his bride. He is talking about that when he says the end of verse 19. Let them return unto thee, but return not thou unto them. As much as you love the people, Jeremiah, as much as you continue to pray for them, even though I told you not to, even though you continue to love them, even though you have no reason to, to love them because they're trying to kill you. Hello, Gala. Good morning. God bless you. He's saying... He's giving Jeremiah a special dispensation in a way. He's saying, okay, let's look at the reality of things. You want me to take revenge on the people who have stolen your land, your house, your father's inheritance, and your bride. They've taken everything away from you. They're chasing you from pillar to post. You have to hide sometimes. You have no certain dwelling place. And you have to go and preach in the temple and people are trying to kill you now. Not only the people of your hometown, but the people you're talking to, they want to stone you. It's not going to be long before the priests talk the princes into putting you in jail. Like the cat said, when he got his tail caught under the rocking chair, it won't be long now. He's saying, let them return to you. You care about this people, Jeremiah? You want me to take revenge on some? You want me to save others? 
well, don't you get involved with them at all. Don't become a part of their life. Don't get wrapped up in their drama. Do not get sucked into their vortex. Let them come to you. But return not thou unto them. In other words, if you want to try to persuade them, Jeremiah, to come to me, then let them come to me, but don't you go to them. You don't trust any of them, remember, because some of them seek your life. So if they return to you, which they would really be returning to God, to me, God is saying, if they return to you, fine. But I don't want you involved in their lives. I don't want you going to them. But if because of your preaching and because of your example and because my power is upon you, because you stand before me, as it says earlier in verse 19, then that'll be okay. They can come back to you, but don't you dare go back to them. It's a strict commandment, a strict order. Now, what God promises Jeremiah, not the people, Jeremiah. He says, I will make thee unto this people a finished brazen wall. I'm going to build a wall. It's going to be huge. <laughs> this is a real wall. It's a God wall. I will make thee unto this people a fenced brazen wall made of brass. And they shall fight against thee. Because the words of Jeremiah, remember, uh, verse, uh, verse 19, I will put my words in your mouth. You'll stand before me. They'll fight against you. If you speak the word of the Lord, people will fight against you. I will make thee unto this people a fenced brazen wall, and they shall fight against thee. But they shall not prevail against thee. Not even the ones who want to kill you. I don't want to give away the story, but I've already told you, so it's too late to not give it away. When we last see Jeremiah, he is still alive on the ash heap of Jerusalem in the book of Lamentations. Yeah, I know they carry him off down into Egypt. Oh, God bless you, Rick. I'm glad you got out of the hospital, man. Um, anyhow. They're not going to prevail against thee. I am with thee to save thee and to deliver thee, saith the Lord. He reassures him again that no matter what he says, no matter what he does, he's going to preserve, God will preserve his life. And after many years, but like I say, by the time we leave Jeremiah, they still haven't killed him. They've done a lot of bad things to him, but they haven't killed him. And I will make thee unto this people a fenced and brazen wall, and they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee to save thee and to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Well, he's there to do that right now, too. The Lord Jesus Christ will save and deliver any and all who come unto him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He can save anybody. He doesn't save everybody, but he could. And the only reason he does it is because people will not believe. They will not come to him. Verse 21, God talking to Jeremiah. And I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked. Give us this day our daily bread. 
Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked. And I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, who hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. I redeem thee from the hand of the terrible. Just like the Hebrew children at the Red Sea, God delivered them from Pharaoh and his great army. I will deliver thee from the hand of the wicked. I will redeem thee from the hand of the terrible. You know, serving the Lord, good morning, Kevin, isn't easy. The phrase goes, well, if it was easy, everybody would do it. But no, everybody wouldn't. <laughs> because everybody can serve the Lord. If you will surrender to the Lord and become his servant, he will, he will command you and you will serve. Some of us are called to do things that require... a public condemnation of the sin around us. It makes it especially difficult sometimes when I was still able to work before my sickness. Before the cancer and the, the brain tumor and all that stuff slowed me down. I was kind of a fire breather, you know. I wanted to get her done. Everywhere I went, and they said, well, when are we going to meet? And I'd say, B&E. That I means bright and early. Let's get up and go. Let's go do it. I loved working. I love getting out and working with the men. I like building. I like being on the job site. Yeah, I played a lot of music for a lot of years, and that was my that was my craft. That was my career. What little career I had in showbiz for those twenty plus years, twenty five years. But my trade that I learned as a boy was the trade of an electrician. And I came back to it when I was 50 years old, believe it or don't, and worked at it for almost four years until I got too sick to work anymore. And I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed being a journeyman tradesman again. I enjoyed rolling out the plans and having projects and getting my helpers lined out and going and doing the big stuff and letting them do all the other work. And then walking behind them and seeing how they did it and then teaching them. That's something we don't do anymore is teach. It became hard for me after I got sick. I tried a number of things. I, I tried sales. I, I had been in sales before and had a mediocre career as a salesman. Made a good living, but I was never gung-ho enough. 
my head was in the clouds. That's what they said, but see, my head was really with God. I did better by going back to my trade. I made just as much money. I had to, physically, it was harder. But I, through muscle memory, I was able to still do the work. And all I had to do was, all I had to do was just refamiliarize myself with some things, and and uh, there were new techniques and new products. I had to see how they worked and why. There were new code requirements. And I had to buff up on that. But I liked working with my hands. Mainly because there was a lot of time left to, just to be in my head with God. And there came a time when I got so sick that I couldn't work that all I could do is work for Jesus. That was the, my only choice. Because I couldn't work anymore with my hands I wasn't strong enough and I I uh, <laughs> it was a matter of stamina well I had to trust the Lord for my income and, and, you know, and I always did. I trusted him for my paycheck. I trusted him for my work, for when I would get jobs and stuff. When I was working for other men, I trusted that, that I would do my job well and not get fired and that I would advance and get paid. And then when I was doing some things on my own after that, uh, because as I got sicker, I got slower. And it was hard for me to justify getting paid for the hour. So I'd made a deal with... with uh, uh, with a couple of contract, with a couple of electrical contractors that I would just, you know, I would just kind of take little jobs that they had and do them. And they would pay me for the job instead of by the hour. Cause if I got sick or if I got tired and I, I didn't know I had cancer yet, but I knew I was tired all the time, you know, well, I'm a, it might take me three di three days to do a one day job, but I still get paid for doing the job and did just about as well. But you see, there came a time when I had to rely completely on the Lord for my income without the work of my own hands. He, he, I, I would have to wait for somebody to call me to come and preach in their church or to come be in a Bible conference or to come speak at a convention. I had to rely completely on him for that. I couldn't call up guys that I knew and say, hey, have you got a house I can wire? Or, hey, have you got a, a small commercial job or something that that you, you need wrapping up? Like there was this guy that, that had one of those storage buildings, you know, where they, they have all the storage rooms. And uh, you just got to make sure that you've got power and light to, to all of those storages. So it's, it's mostly underground work until they get the thing built. The underground's the hardest part is getting getting all that PVC pipe in the ground so you can get power to all those buildings because they've all got to have a light out in front of them and they've got to have a receptacle in there and a light inside the, uh, the storage space. And boy, you know, I, I'd grab one of those. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really have to depend on God although I was depending on God to lead me to people who would give me the work. But now I had to depend on God to actually give me the money to cause somebody else to have me come and speak or play my fiddle and sing or guitar or do a music event or whatever they were calling me to do, preaching or music or both. And... When he made me rely completely on him, it changed my life. And I'd had more cancer since then. I've had more surgery since then. I'm, I'm probably fixing to have fixing to have a little more surgery now. 
But what it did, this reliance completely upon God, it got to the point where, well, I'm not saying anymore, well, God, you know, where am I going to work this month and, and how much am I going to make and will there be enough? I don't question those things anymore. There's always enough. And God tells God tells people to help me. And every, everybody who's gone through this uh, understands that there comes a time in your life with God. And it, it, the details will be different. But there will come a time when you will have to completely rely on him. It may not be for your income. It may be for your sanity. <laughs> you may have to rely on him and him alone to keep your mind sound. You may have to rely on him and him alone to preserve your marriage because maybe one of you uh, messed up uh, and uh, did things to hurt the other person and the marriage looks like it's going to fall apart. And the only thing that can save it is the hand of God. There might come a time when the only way for you to bring a wayward child back to you is to not, you're not able to do anything with that child or with circumstances. You have to rely on God to bring back that child. Even if that child's 40 years old, there's going to come a time. And if you haven't got there yet, there will come a time. And I don't care whether you're a preacher or whether you have never even spoken up in Sunday school. We're all servants of Christ. And if you serve Christ, there will come a time when you will have to depend on Christ and Christ alone to deliver you from the situation that you're in, to provide for you in the situation that you're in, or if he doesn't deliver you to sustain you and keep you in the situation that you're in. And that is common to every believer. The way you have that kind of faith then is to nurture and grow that kind of faith now when things are okay. I had an old preacher tell me one time, he says, don't wait till you're starving to death to go grocery shopping. <laughs> don't wait until the cupboard's bare to go to the store. You make your relationship with Christ sound and sturdy and steady right now so that when the time of trouble comes, you won't have any problem turning to him. God has been using Jeremiah, and he reminds him that I, I separated you. I put my words in your mouth. You stand before me. You have spoken my words to the people. You are mine wholly and completely. Uh, everything that they know, they learn through you. I've told you to tell them. Now you're just going to have to trust me, Jeremiah, that these men that are trying to kill you are not going to be successful. It's interesting to me that God doesn't tell Jeremiah to shut up and quit complaining. <laughs> you know why he doesn't? Because he knows that Jeremiah is going to keep complaining. He knew Jeremiah just as well as he knows me or you. And so he doesn't tell him to shut up. He just reassures him that I'm going to take care of it. I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked and I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. I am with thee to save and to deliver thee. They shall not prevail against thee. He's able. He's able to bring thee again. He did it for Jeremiah. He did and does it for me. He'll do it for you too. God bless you.